I think we have a treat in store tonight, um, and a rich and complicated and inspiring and infuriating topic all at once. Um, so the title of this panel is Technology and the Values that Guide. Um, it comes, it could not come at a more opportune time. We are at a pivotal moment in which society is wrestling anew with its relationship with technology. And I think, you know, there's a number of things that we've collectively woken up to in the last few years, but the question of technology's role in our lives is front and center. And the headlines that we're seeing today are the tip of the iceberg, right? So you can look at headlines about the Cambridge Analytica scandal or um, self-driving cars and fatalities, um, but there are much, much broader questions in which the code that guides how these technologies are being driven is being written now, um, and the values that are behind it are up for grabs. If in the last few decades it was okay to assume that technology was gonna change the world for good, and it has. There are so many amazing ways in which it has and it continues to. It is now also incumbent upon us to ask, what are the risks and the ways in which this can go wrong? And what are the trade-offs? And how will we as a society collectively adjudicate those trade-offs to make sure that we're maximizing the good in the world? Um, so, so I, you know, I want to just get quickly into this discussion, but a few words about the, the panelists before we do. Um, sitting, uh, I guess, sitting right to my, to my left there, to Micah Tillman, who's the co-founder and director of the, the Blockchain Trust Accelerator New America, and also a speechwriter and senior advisor to the last two secretaries of state. Then to his left, Varun Gori, senior economist of, uh, at the World Bank in develop, development economics, where he co-leads a mind behavior unit using behavioral science to make development programs and the, de the delivery of technology more effective. Then we have Anne Hale Milleracy, the CEO of Radiant Earth, also an investee of Omidyar Network, um, a company that creates geospatial analytics using imagery and mapping data to help solve challenges in the developing world. And then finally, last but not least, Simon Seegers, the CEO of ARM, a British multinational semiconductor and software design company, which has been called the world's most influential intellectual property design company. He also sits on the boards of amongst, amongst organizations, SoftBank, Global Semiconductor Alliance, and Dolby Labs. So we only have, uh, we have short of an hour for this conversation. And, and I, and I think we should dive in and dive in on, on, on a sort of positive, inspiring note because all of these folks are, you know, they're working on technologies ranging from blockchain to AI to geospatial tech um, and much more that have just tremendous potential. Um, so I thought we'd sort of start with that um, and start with like where, you know, what is it that gives you hope as you think about these technologies and sort of drives you, drives you to work on that? So maybe to Micah, let's start with you. Blockchain is a Blockchain. great place to, to dig in on this. And at its core, is it is a technology that builds efficiency and trust. Uh, I'll give you three sets of numbers that help me define this in my own mind. Uh, the first is when we think about grant making, if you look at numbers from the United Nations, their estimates are that about 30% of all of the resources that are deployed in frontier market environments are lost to malfeasance. And another 15% are lost to reporting and monitoring and evaluation. So that means that before we even get out of the gate, 45 cents out of every dollar uh, are being diverted to uses that really don't help us move the mission forward. Next set of numbers that I would focus on is from the US government. Uh, last year, the Treasury, and we talked to them a lot, uh, made $144 billion in improper payments. That's billion with a B, which even by the standards of Washington is a lot of money. And the reason that this is happening is because their systems aren't talking to each other. Uh, the last number that I will cite is $3.5 trillion, which is the estimate of the amount that is lost to corruption worldwide each year. Blockchain has the potential to dramatically reduce 
each of these negative numbers and in doing so, free up potentially trillions of dollars in capital that can be diverted to help us uh, solve challenges around the world. And that's what you're working on. So give us an example of the kind of project that you're engaged in right now. So uh, a few examples from the work we're doing at the Blockchain Trust Accelerator. Uh, we just launched a new partnership with Coca-Cola and the State Department to combat forced labor in Coca-Cola's supply chain. The challenge they face is that in too many instances, they'll have a company that will recruit workers from Nepal or Bangladesh to go and work in uh, Dubai or Abu Dhabi. And they will be offered very favorable terms uh, when they are recruited in Nepal or Bangladesh and offered a very different set of terms when they land on the ground in Dubai or Abu Dhabi. Uh, and their passport is confiscated and there's no way for them to validate the original terms of the agreement. Blockchain can create a secure, digital, notarized record of the agreement that they signed up to, and in doing so, help reduce the prevalence of forced labor. And for anyone in the audience who has heard blockchain a million times, and by the way, I wish I had a dollar. I would be like as rich as the Bitcoin billionaires if I had a dollar for every time I've heard blockchain in the last three months. Um, but, uh, but just explain, what is blockchain? At its core, blockchain is a record, and records are obviously nothing new. Humanity's been using records for about 5,500 years. But blockchain combines two attributes that we've never been able to put together before. The first is that it's distributed, so it is a record that is held simultaneously, in the case of public blockchains, on thousands of computers around the world. Those computers are constantly checking each other to ensure that only information that should be entered into the record is entered into the record, and they, they also maintain the integrity of the record. The second piece of blockchain, which is important for us to keep in mind, is that it is permanent. So once information is put into the blockchain, it can be updated, but it can never be erased. And so if you're trying to design a system to promote transparency, efficiency, and accountability, this is more powerful than anything humanity has come up with to date. And it has a very long list of potential applications in many sectors. And I might say also trust. Let's come back to that. Um, and let's skip to you now. Um, so, uh, so you're using a variety of really interesting geospatial technologies. And, and the analytics around that alone are fascinating. Give us an example or two of the applications that you're working on. Sure, so um, at Radiant Earth, we work with cloud computing and now just starting with blockchain um, and with providers of space-based imagery, aircraft imagery, and, um, and now drone imagery. And there's a real revolution going on in the space-based imagery sector. It's called New Space, and it was founded 20 miles north of here to 20 miles south of here. And it's been a huge disruption in what has traditionally been the Earth observation uh, market. Um, now, every day, commercial companies image the Earth. Every square inch of the Earth is imaged every day. Government civil satellites, most of that data is, is free and open, image the Earth about every three and a half to four days. So we're awash in data, but the problem is it's very difficult to find and use that data for your given project. At Radiant Earth, we're focused on aggregating all of the world's open imagery as well as working with the commercial providers to bring that technology to the global development and humanitarian community. One, I think, good example is a project we're actually doing for the Gates Foundation in relation to the sustainable development goals of sanitation. It's not very sexy, but it is pretty cool. And that is that they are operating um, many waste treatment facilities in Senegal. And they actually pay those operators to operate the facilities, but they have no independent records of what's actually getting treated in that facility. And we're monitoring three of their facilities from space using Earth observation visual imagery as well as um, radar imagery to monitor those sites every day and correlate that data with what the operator says and what they're billing um, and looking for correlations. And in fact, it, it's, it's working. 
So we can provide that level of o oversight and correlation. We're also doing work on illegal forestry, on, on transparency and journalism. Um, so there, uh, you, you know, geography, everything happens in a place. And geography is often the fundamental denominator in many of society's most difficult problems. And now that the earth is being imaged absolutely every day, I believe that we should be able to help the humanitarian and global development community put those technologies to work uh, for these problems, much like the commercial sector is putting this technology to work for the futures market, because that is what's driving the innovation in the earth observation market. And I think we have many of the same issues and we can and we can deal with them in the same way. Hmm. Fascinating. And there is there is an example when we talked. There was an example about um, you, you, there was one case that you, you used with mal malaria bed nets and Catholic Relief Services. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So um, we, uh, you know, over the past couple of years, I've spent a lot of time dealing with the largest philanthropic organizations around the globe and their investments in geospatial data and technology. And I was aware of a, a program in Nigeria to map all of Nigeria, every building, and estimate populations. And that work is being done for the Gates Foundation uh, for their polio program. And I had started a conversation with Catholic Relief Services, and they had received a contract to distribute 30 million bed nets in Nigeria in three states. And they wanted to work with Radiant to use remote sensing to identify where all of those communities were and what the ingress and egress was so that they could you know, deliver the bed nets in an appropriate way. And they were you know, willing to sign on to a significant project and I said, you know what? That's great, but you don't need to do that and you'll have the data tomorrow. Because the Gates Foundation had mapped all of Nigeria all of the roads, all of the waterways, all of the political boundaries, and all of the buildings, and then estimated all of the population and the segmentation of that population, we were able to deliver that data within 24 hours to Catholic Relief Services, and they were able to run their bed net distribution program more efficiently, much faster, with better outcomes. Mm -hmm. That data is all public and open, but it's a stranded asset because people can't find it. And cloud computing and metadata and registries and machine learning allows us to do that type of work. I believe that this community can benefit as much as the futures market uh, from machine learning, for, from earth observations, from blockchain, if we just coalesce and build build the facility to do that. And, and Simon, I mean, you, your work sits at the intersection of a lot of these technologies. Um, and, and the technologies that you license creates the backbones for so many different innovations. Talk a little bit from your perch about the promise that you're seeing and, and some of the programs that you yourself have created in this vein. Yeah, I mean, some of the examples that have been uh, discussed here kind of rely on um, tiny devices getting more and more intelligence. Uh, intelligent, rather, uh, the ability to gather data, process it locally, move it into the cloud, um, take data from different sources and put them together to gain insight. I mean, that as an overall trend is driving a lot of our business. Um, you, you asked at the beginning, what, you know, what's driving change? For, for me, it's um, the accessibility of technology um, and the increase or decreasing cost of technology and access to technology and the more and more people who are getting access to technology means that people can experiment in ways that they never could before. You know, you don't have to have a manufacturing facility to build one thing. You can buy, you know, very low cost development boards. You can get access to as much compute resource as you want in the cloud and that enables innovation from people. So, uh, you know, what we're all about is, is enabling the intelligence in all these devices and trying to liberate as much innovation as we possibly can through the partnerships we develop. Um, you know, specifically around, around the global goals that you mentioned, Anne, you know, we, we had a kind of uh, penny drop moment a few years ago that actually this technology, this embedded intelligence, this um, everything being networked, uh, creates an opportunity to address all of the global goals. And we've been working uh, with our partners to try and raise awareness of that and get people thinking that, okay, that, that doing that is doing good for the world, but actually there's a real business case behind it. 
um, whether it's about um, you know, deploying sensors in remote parts of developing uh, economies, it's the same technology that people can use in, in the developed world. Um, so we're really trying to ra uh, raise awareness. Uh, we launched a program called 2030 Vision, uh, where we're specifically trying to bring our partners in uh, to get focused on addressing the global goals. Uh, and, that, and that's one example. Mm. Um. And I, I want to come back to that, but before I do, um, Varun, you also sit at, at a pretty unique perch where uh, my understanding is that you're dealing with lots of different technologies as they're being deployed in emerging markets, and you're, you're thinking about how behavioral science interventions might make their delivery more effective. So from that perch, how do you see the promise of tech? Yeah, so um, our goal is to use behavioral science to make development projects and programs more effective. Not all our projects use technology, but when we do, we use them in two ways. The first is to add cognitive bandwidth to people whose lives are stressed and difficult. The second is to use technology as a platform to deliver behaviorally informed messages like reminders, social norms, social comparisons, cues to new mental models that can help people save more, stay in school, make better health choices, start new businesses. So on, on a couple of words about each. On the first one, um, adding cognitive bandwidth, the background is some compelling recent research that shows that we need to think about poverty differently. We typically think that if someone's poor, they're, it's, um, it's, a, it's an access problem. They don't have access to resources or to schools or health, and that's true. However, we also know now that poverty is a decision-making context. When you're poor, you tunnel and you focus on really what's in front of you. Some research shows that um, Indian sugarcane farmers, um, post-harvest, when they had money, compared to pre-harvest, when they were deeply in debt and didn't have money yet, uh, post-harvest they scored 10 IQ points higher. That's a lot. If I gave you all a test now, and I'm not really going to do this, but if I did, and then kept you up all night, tomorrow morning you would score 12 to 13 points lower. So it's almost a full night of sleep from this, right? So we're it's gonna, We're going to do that afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry to give it away. Um, so being poor, uh, drains cognitive bandwidth, fluid intelligence, executive uh, function, self-control. So what we can do is use technologies to help people make better decisions for themselves. One example is in the context of modern contraception. Um, subcutaneous injectables, IUDs, have lots of advantage over the pill and other contraceptives, but they're not appropriate for everyone because of clinical contraindications or they're uh, not what people want. They want to get pregnant right away. They're also new and it's hard to understand if that's the right choice for a person. It's hard for a community health worker who typically herself is poor and herself has a, you know, a tough life to give good counseling. So we've developed a tablet-based app to encode you know, the uh, right kinds of guidance to help people make better decisions, and we're uh, um, going to pilot it in Cameroon, in Bangladesh. Uh, we're helping union social workers deal. They administer, you know, several different social transfer programs, overwhelming information. Uh, you know, uh, so we're helping them with, al with also a, a tablet to develop um, to, to 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 make better choices in their in their guidance. And then one example on the last one, and this is um, a technology called a comic book you know, which is still a technology, I think, in some ways for many people. Um, we're using tech, um, comic books and YouTube videos to bring out growth mindset, which is this idea that students um, might not study, do well in school because they think they're just stuck. Uh, we did this in Peru, it really worked. For a two-hour intervention, got a 0.1 standard deviation increase in test scores, you know, 20 cents per kid. Uh, three or four months of learning very quickly. We're using uh, YouTube videos and comic books to try it out in Indonesia and South Africa. So I guess our perspective is that um, uh, technology can be very powerful, if, but especially if guided by behavioral science that helps people use it appropriately and encodes messages uh, that helps them make better decisions uh, for their own, uh, to improve their own lives. And, and, I, and I think that's, that's probably a universal takeaway, right, is that technology can be quite beneficial, but it's the context in which it's delivered that determines whether it's beneficial. Um, and, and, and I suppose one other takeaway thus far also is that, you know, for all the talk about the good that technology can do in the world, um, 
the 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 Anns and the Tamikas of the world are you know still relatively rare. What where um, we have you know we have a number of commercial entities at scale, um, and there is not enough resources going into deploying technology for social good for things that might not yet be commercial. Um, and and uh, and I think that's that's if you're a philanthropist sitting in the audience, I think that's one thing to think about. The other thing to think about is what we need to turn to now, which is this question of risk. Um, and for too long at conferences uh, around development or conferences around philanthropy, we've talked about tech for social good as if it were a unidimensional thing, like that all you had to do was, was think like, I'm deploying this technology for this social purpose, so it has to be good. Um, and, and I think the last few years has, have been humbling in that regard. Um, and, and, and the question of trust how do we trust uh, the values that are embedded in technology is, is sort of front and center. Simon, when we talked, you were reflecting on this, this trajectory um, and this moment that we find ourselves in as a society. I wonder if you might reflect on that and also, I, I, I was I was really fascinated by this Gen Arm 2Z initiative that you guys launched, which is which is uh, on that theme too. If you might comment on that. Yeah, well, that, that kind of builds on what uh, Varun was saying about um, you know understanding human behavior. Um, so we've been doing some work with a cyber psychologist, lady named uh, Dr. Mary Aiken, who has been studying people's relationships with technology, particularly uh, some of the threats that, uh, that young people are exposed to online. <clears throat> and one of the observations she made that, again, is one of those moments where you go, oh, of course, is that the, the technology is changing so fast. It changes faster than traditional study methods of around human behavior can keep up. So just by the time you finish the study, it's the next thing that's moved on. Um, and when you couple that with, with thinking about how as a parent you raise a child, you, your, your job as a parent is to make sure your child understands the risks of the world that they're going out into. A lot of the risks they're being exposed to online didn't exist when we as now parents were growing up. So how do you prepare your child for that? Um, you know, I like to think of myself as fairly tech savvy and kind of on top of what, what's going on in the world of tech, but I watch my son on his computer and think, Hang on a minute, what, what is that? <laughs> it, it's really quite scary. So, as scary as it is, you know, that technology is gonna keep moving and, and I don't think any of us can stop that. But, you know, when we look at, uh, you know, the glory that, it, that technology has, has delivered to date and we think about this world of data and, and analyzing it and what AI can do, the efficiencies that can bring, uh, there are bound to be some unintended uh, consequences from that. Uh, in the same way as um, you know, smartphone addiction, uh, computer gaming addiction, uh, thing, you know, cyber crime. You know, nobody thought about that when they thought, hang on, wouldn't it be a good idea if we connect like everything on the planet? It, yeah, it is, but you've really got to think it through. So you know, our view was before we kind of launch into this world of AI and big data, um, we should you know, take a moment to reflect on what has, has happened so far and think about how um, what kind of relationships we all should have with technology going forwards, and particularly what kind of relationships young people should have, who are fairly blasé about the risks. You know, when I look at my own kids, yeah, again, scary moment as a parent. So we, we're just trying to raise awareness of that, and that's what our program about uh, Gen Arm to Z is about. It's about getting some young people to talk about how they use technology uh, and trying to broaden the discussion about this issue, because as technologists, we're going to deliver it, and I don't think we can just absolve ourselves of any of the um, any of those side effects. Mm -hmm. and, and and part of the idea there is that it's not just the technologists who should be having these conversations about values. That it that it's society at large that should be having this conversation. Uh, absolutely. I mean, you, you know, technology is is delivered to us from tech companies, but. Um, you know, as, as consumers, we get the opportunity to vote with our wallets and, you know, collectively we can have a, a voice about what is acceptable, what isn't acceptable. Um, you know, the whole debate around use of data over the last uh, a month or so has been really quite illuminating and actually I think in a lot of ways helpful because the amount of data that's about to get sampled, whether it's about us as individuals or the environment we're in, that's about to go up exponentially. Um, now's a really good time to be thinking about who gets the data, what can they use it for, who owns it, uh, really quite fundamental questions that frankly we've been brushing under the carpet mm -hmm. because there hasn't been any downside. All these services are free. Right. Turns out they're not. Right, right.
And to that, to that end, you know, Tamika, when you think about blockchain, you've, you've laid out, you know, an incredible picture of its benefits and upsides. Um, you know, I personally worry about, uh, from the perspective of like, of, of privacy, but from the perspective of the European concept of the right to be forgotten, with people that will have records that they don't want there. What do you feel, like, are there sectors that should not adopt blockchain and are there risks that you're worried about? Well, that certainly is not a solution for every yeah. problem. Uh, and it's critical before any organization decides that they're going to migrate a system onto a blockchain-based platform that they think hard about those long-term design implications. Um, this is a technology with a unique ability to codify trust. And to go back to your earlier question, trust is absolutely fundamental because every interaction that we have, every uh, instance of human cooperation is ultimately predicated on trust. And if we lose that, and if we lose our faith in the facts that our institutions are responsible for uh, codifying, our ability to do great things as a species erodes pretty rapidly. Uh, and so in this case, I think there are some benefits and, and there's some potential drawbacks. On the upside, uh, this is a new vehicle for establishing the validity and the authenticity of information uh, in a way that is more efficient and arguably more effective than anything we've been able to do previously. Uh, and, and that's very powerful and we should take advantage of that. On, on the other side though, and, and this is not insignificant, we are making design uh, decisions right now that are going to be with us for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And the lesson of the last couple of months should be that we should not make those design decisions lightly. Uh, next week, uh, with the help of the Rockefeller Foundation, we're bringing together a sitting prime minister, the heads of many blockchain companies, and an array of policymakers at uh, the Rockefeller Foundation's Bellagio Center to start thinking through the grand strategy around the deployment of blockchain for public problem solving. But we need to have that conversation now because we're at an inflection point. And if we miss the boat, we're gonna be in a pretty bad place and quickly. What, what do you think are the kind of safeguards that are necessary? The short answer is we need to take advantage of the technology's ability to keep information that should be private, private. Uh, and provide transparency where we want transparency and do that very strategically and deliberately. We are entering a world where AI is gonna be pretty ubiquitous. All of the models that we have had for AI for the last 20 years have been dependent on centralized data storage and centralized data structures. Unfortunately, those models can lead to some pretty scary places pretty quickly. And one of the potential promises of blockchain is that eventually you and I will be able to have our own data wallets, we'll be able to provide access or revoke access to our information if we do it right. And again, there's a question of whether we're gonna do it right. But that should give a lot more people a lot more say in how these new technologies are deployed and democratize the potential uh, of some of these new tools in a way that will be very challenging if we stick with existing models. Hmm. Um. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to that. I wanna, I wanna go to Anne. Um, and I, you know, when you talked about the amount of data that's being generated every second, it is both awe-inspiring, um, it is mind-boggling, you know, going back to what, what Simon was saying about um, the role of data, you know, and, and uh, what, it can, what it can open up and what risks it also creates and who owns the data and who monetizes the data. Um, how, when you think about the data you're dealing with, it allows you to do great things, but if it ends up in the wrong hands, it could create harm. What safeguards do you generally try to build into your own work around those topics? Yeah, so geospatial data, in particular uh, raster-based imagery data, is not big data. It's fat, it's obese, it's as big as it gets. Um, and obese data, you heard it here first, yeah. folks. Uh, but, um, and, and managing that data is, is no small problem, but when building large repositories or registries of connected data and cloud environment, um, and protecting that data from our, in the imaging world, and we've been imaging the earth for a very long time, and it started really in earnest, um, 
1952 with a program called Keyhole, run by the National Reconnaissance Office and the CIA of the United States. Um, we have always been worried about bad actors. That's the number one threat um, of imaging data taken from satellites and from aircraft. And that threat doesn't go away. It doesn't go away with open data. In many ways, it gets bigger. Um, but it is incumbent upon technology platform divide, um, providers to put in place tools to know your customer. Um, and at the Radiant Earth program, we're, we're certainly doing that, know your customer uh, tools. We're actually bundling that. We've just kicked off a project. I was talking to, my, to Tamika about it today. Um, to bundle know your customer tools with blockchain um, to try to protect that. Um, we have an ulterior motive in that there are some big buyers for commercial satellite imagery in, in the global development market. There are the Gates Foundation, there are the Omidyar Network, there are the Rockefeller Foundation, there's DFID. These are huge buyers that buy data, that have a license, that say that they can share it with other nonprofits. And, and generally, they can share it with anybody as long as there's not a commercial use. But they don't because they're afraid of breaking the license. And they have no way of putting that online and making it discoverable without running the risk of breaking the license. So we're working with them to ingest their data and uh, put KYC tools in place in addition to blockchain to expose this data that's already been paid for by the philanthropic communities to support global development. So I think that's another great use of blockchain. The concerns I have um, around satellite imagery are around bad actors, um, and we deal with that, and this community has dealt with it for a long time, around the invasion of privacy um, and that actually in, in the U.S., there's a good bit of, um, uh, of case law that settled much of that issue. And in fact, it won't come as any surprise that, that case law came out of California um, for a very famous actress who had a very large ranch um, about 300 miles south of here. Her ranch was photographed by the state of California at one foot resolution. Uh, for their property mapping taxes, and she <laughs> sued the state of California and lost. Um, because there's no ex uh, expectation of privacy um, at that scale. What changes that in a big way is drone imagery. Um, and that actually does keep me up at night, um, because drones now are becoming so ubiquitous, more so outside the U.S. than inside the U.S. The innovation on drones is really happening, and sub-Saharan Africa and in India, but you can get two centimeter imagery from a drone that is beautiful imagery, and you can identify a face. Um, you can identify a street address. You can identify a mailbox. You can identify a license plate. So I, I think there's some serious work to be done there. I think the best example of how that's been mitigated at scale is by Google Maps Street View. So if you've gone to Google, Google Maps Street View, you've looked at your yard, if your car is in front of your yard, you'll see that that license plate has been um, blurted out. It's um, been anonymized by machine learning. And if by chance your children happen to have been in the front yard, their faces are no longer recognizable. So I think that there are issues there that we can deal with. The, the final issue related to imaging is really around other sensitive data. And, and the mapping community has dealt with some of this for a long time, and that is data like archaeological sites and, and the location of endangered species. We generally, as a society, do not release that information because if we do, it goes away. Um, and so that's been on a need-to-know basis, and generally it's not an open record. What concerns me about the future, just one example, I am sure, I am positive, that in five years, some wonderful 
graduate student in, at MIT or at Stanford or Ber Berkeley or at the University of Twente or anywhere around the world, will be able to use satellite imagery at a three meter resolution, which is full and open, and machine learning to identify tribes, forgotten tribes, or uncontacted people. We'll, we'll be able to find them. We'll be able to find them with probably a 95% certainty. But should we? You know, should we? And is it a graduate student that we want to have the power to do that? Yeah. So. I think there are a lot of questions that have yet to be asked. I agree. And, and, I, and, and you sort of get a sense from this panel and, and, and from this work at large that we're just sort of scratching the surface, that there, there are a number of really great efforts, like what you're hearing about here, just even just this last example of, of blurring out images using, using machine learning. Um, and so you get the sense that of this sort of inchoate set of standards that are forming, but a lot of work that has to get done. Um, I want to ask one more individual question, and then I'm going to ask you a bunch of like group questions to have you, to have you interact. Did, did you want to say something? Oh, okay. Um, so, so Varun, uh, you know, one of the things we talked about, um, and that, you know, if we think about how do we encode values in technology, uh, the question that, that next comes is, whose values? And one of the questions that we talked about uh, last week was this question of paternalism in delivering technology in emerging markets. How do you think about that question and how do you think about the solutions to that question? Yeah, that's an important issue for sure. Um, so I, I guess the way that I think about um, it is that to really what we're fundamentally talking about is smart regulation, right? How do we sort of develop rules to help individuals and improve our collective lives. And I think for that, we need first better facts. You know, I think most of us are not very good at guarding our own privacy. And we need to really understand what motivates people to guard their own privacy. You know, there's a set of things about information and we, a lot of us like to bury our head in the sand, honestly, you know, and uh, cognitive dissonance, uh, sort of a investments in an identity, strategic reasons. I think we can really understand uh, the, the human nature and the psychology of that better. Um, and then um, I think clarifying our values helps with the paternalism question. Um, and here, you know, the, the world in which I work, behavioral science and public policy is sometimes, you know, people have concerns that it's, you know, manipulative, it's paternalistic, you're sort of, you know, you're telling these girls to use a contraceptive, you're telling people to save, how do you know that's good for them? Um, and the way I think about that is that, you know, this is really a tool, right? It's like taxation, it's like a, setting a law, which is sort of a more, it's a harder paternalism. This is just a tool. It can be used for good or for bad, um, and that's for us to decide. And I think we need to sort of think about what are our, what are the, criteria and the values that we would use to assess this tool. And that's, I think that's about becoming clear in our values. And I think, you know, in, in, in a place like the United States anyway, that's about respecting autonomy, it's about improving welfare, respecting dignity, and it's about self-government, right? So we want to make sure, I mean, I think those are values we more or less agree on. And if we can sort of be conscious of those, we can evaluate whether the tool is being used in a certain way. Um, I think there's room in my world for actual clarification, like a code of ethics on this, you know? Sort of, I think that someone, if anyone's interested in this, that's something that we'd be interested in exploring, thinking about how we can actually, you know, the various behavioral science nudging teams, think about what's, what's the right set of rules to guide, because that doesn't exist just yet. But then can I say one last thing, Paula, which is that I think there's also conflicts of values that, we, and that, that are important. And this is because I think technologies are gonna have economic consequences. They're gonna have an effect on inequality, one way or another. And I think that's a contested value in our society. And I think we need to sort of, it's not gonna be easy to think about that. In the world I'm in, you know, as you move to digital money, people don't feel as attached to it as they do you know, actual currency. There's something intangible. And so they're just less attached to it. And that's an opportunity for people that wanna take it from you uh, legitimately or illegitimately through, you know, some kind of payday loan or something to, to do that. And we may need rules to help people and uh, guard against rising levels of inequality. Super hard questions to grapple with. Um, 
I, I want to ask all of you why, why, why you personally come to this conversation. Why do you care about it? And, and, and Simon, you mentioned your son. I, you know, I also have a two-year-old daughter who sometimes says to me, Mommy, no phone. Uh, which is really humbling. I'll, I'll you know, also say, uh, you know, I spent the last five years investing in technology-driven startups with a social mission. I, you know, I bought the technology for good uh, mantra, hook, line, and sinker, and the last few years have been sort of humbling for me in terms of the number of unintended consequences that have come down the pike, which is part of why Pierre and, and Omidyar Network, we created this Tech and Society Solutions Lab to try to, um, to try to avert some of that. What, what brings you guys personally to this conversation? Why do you care about it personally? I'll say in my case, I had for four years probably the best job in Washington. And I led a team that operated a lot like a venture fund. And our job was to find the best ideas we could for supporting good governance and civil society around the world, and then deliver the tech, talent, resources, and partners required to make those ideas come to life. And we had a lot of marvelous successes, but we also had a lot of frustration. And in most instances, that frustration originated from the fact that even when you had good leaders who wanted to do the right thing, in too many cases, in too many countries, the underlying systems that they were working with were so broken and opaque and you know, too often corrupt that it was extremely difficult for them to deliver on the legitimate expectations of citizens and stakeholders. And we recognized that we needed new architecture that could break through that old paradigm. The best counterexample to what we saw in, in many countries uh, was Estonia. And Estonia had developed the world's leading system v governance. And when we went and sat down with the Estonians, they said, look, if we were to do this again today, we would build the whole system on blockchain. Uh, because it is transparent, it is efficient, uh, it allows people to own data, it allows people to share data as they want to, uh, it has the attributes you need to, to deliver infrastructure, digital infrastructure, for the 21st century. Uh, and uh, we recognized there was immense possibility in that, and now we're working to realize that possibility. Hmm. Anyone else want to comment? Personal motivations? Yeah, um, at Arm, we've lived through this kind of mobile revolution and, yeah. and feel kind of proud about the contribution that we've made to that. We, we see the, the good that it has done and yeah. um, people that come to, to work in the company kind of get a kick out of, um, you know, the work that they do actually changing the way people live their lives and, and the benefits from it. As we look at this, you know, what's coming, you know, some of the technologies that we are helping create, um, you, you know, we look at that and think this isn't optional. You know, the, the planet is going to keep on getting more and more populated. Uh, urbanization causes a great deal of stress on infrastructure. Um, a growing middle class places a great deal of stress on the planet's ability to feed us all. And technology can go a long way to help address these issues along with, you know, aging populations and chronic health disease, all these things. Now, you know, so, so we see an opportunity around this, which is going to be good for our business. Um, we see that as, as good for our, our broader partnership. Um, but it won't get delivered unless people trust the technology. And you won't get the trust in the technology unless you can address some of the security issues. And you won't get any of that unless you can address some of the ethics issues. Um, so these are big, hard problems, which we see as uh, needing to be solved to uh, expand what will ultimately be you know, our business and the tech sector as a whole. So you know, we, we're interested in it, kind of selfishly, <laughs> but we're also interested in it because it's these kind of problems that, that draw people to come and work in our company. Hmm. And, I, and I should say, I find that remarkable because I, because I think there are a number of companies that are addressing this as sort of a, um, a defensive PR exercise as, as opposed to a proactive, you know, this is in our business interest and it's in our talent interest and whatnot. Um, and it, it would be interesting to think about, like, what is the shift that's required to get to that, that mindset across, across the industry? But Anne, it sounded like you wanted to say something. Yeah, so, I, you know, I've been a remote sensing scientist for 34 years now, and um, I've had the pleasure and the pain of working on some fabulous projects to being the first to map the Greenland ice sheet uh, to look for evidence of climate change with lasers to mapping the country of Papua New Guinea, maybe the most difficult country on the face of the earth to map, uh, to finding the FARC 
in, uh, in the Amazon rainforest to responding to the World Trade Center events of 9-11 and flying that site three times a day for 21 days and, uh, and to mapping the coral reefs of Hawaii. And I have never been more positive about the power of remote sensing technology and geospatial technologies to help the global development community in particular. This is a new community to me. I know a lot about mapping. I know a lot about technology. I know very little about the, the world that you live in. I've only been in it for just north of two years. It's a very fragmented market. There are a lot of players with a lot of common denominators. And with the fusion of technologies like cloud computing and the revolution in Earth observations and remote sensing and blockchain technology and machine learning, it's inspirational. I only wish I was 20 years younger um, to be there to continue to drive this because we're going to see radical change, I think, in what we can map and monitor and be a part of a solution to support other organizations that carry this information into the field. And, you know, I was inspired the first day that I was treed by an alligator in a swamp when I was 21 years old on my 21st birthday. And I think I'm more inspired today, um, many, many years later. That sounds like a very interesting story. It was a good story. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is, you know, we're, we're talking about a diffused number of technologies and like a mind-blowing number of use cases. Is there anything that's keeping you up at night that we're, you know, that you think the folks in the room are not aware of? Or what are the biggest things that we're not talking about that we should be talking about? I, I think that some of the ethics issues that Varun mentioned are things that people don't want to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, people, and we see this from surveys we run, you know, people are worried about computers making decisions and not understanding how computers are going to make decisions. And I think if the, the world of tech is left to its own devices, that is what's going to happen. Um, but these ethics issues, you know, ultimately, somebody has to make a call about what is ethically good and what is ethically bad. The, the medical industry seems to have, have kind of lived through that in, in quite a positive way. Um, you know, there are a whole load of rules surrounding what you can and can't do in a lab um, that people, you know, generally, I hope, abide to. Uh, and as a public, we, we kind of accept. Um, in the world of tech, there are going to be similar issues. Uh, you know, self-driving cars are being developed all around us here. They're going to have accidents. Right? Well, there, well, there are humans involved, there are going to be accidents. While there is weird weather happening, there are going to be accidents. How the car in the moment makes the decision, yeah. somebody's going to code that. And, and actually understanding how humans make those decisions in the moment, it just, just not understood. Um, so, so those things, you know, these are really hard problems. Um, and uh, people, you know, ultimately, I think governments are going to have to legislate about what is good and bad. And that's something that I think a lot of people, you know, you know generally government reputation is, is well learned, you know, want to steer away from having somebody tell us what is ethically good and bad in, in the field of technology. But someone's going to make that call. But it's interesting that you use the example of self-driving cars. I mean, I think that's one of the clearest examples of where most people, most reasonable people would say, oh, yes, like there's probably a need for a regulatory regime there. Um, but, but broadly, um, do you, are you optimistic that technologists will be open to the kind of um, self-regulation that you're talking about in the medical industry, right? So the medical industry has licensing. It has uh, review boards and whatnot. Do you feel that that, do you think it's possible to have a shift in the way technologists thinks about, about themselves and the sort of general libertarian tendencies in technology? Like, do you, do you think we will get there? Um, I, I think ultimately we, we're going to have to. Uh, and again, the events of the last couple of uh, weeks around data, um, uh, you know, could, I, I've said this a number of times at conferences, look, un unless we regulate ourselves, we're going to wake up one day and find somebody else regulates us. And this might be the moment when that kind of comes home to roost. So I think the industry is going to have to get its head around this. Hmm. The, the other thing that I would add, at least yeah. as it relates to blockchain technology, is our existing systems have all sorts of problems but they're pretty human systems. And that means that when we make mistakes, there are at least human mechanisms available to redress those mistakes. 
Increasingly with blockchain technology, you're seeing the emergence of smart contracts that are entirely automated processes. And because the information that goes into the system is locked into the system, it's going to be very difficult to undo mistakes. We're going to have to get very creative in terms of how we deal with dispute resolution. We're going to have to prepare for a world in which we are experiencing the merger of technical code and legal code mm -hmm. in ways that those things have never merged before. And uh, again, we are right now, uh, I think, looking at 19th century institutions mm -hmm. that are using 20th century technology to address 21st century challenges and failing pretty miserably. Uh, and, and we're gonna have to dramatically accelerate the capability of our institutions to address these issues if we don't wanna end up uh, again in a pretty concerning place. Yeah, please. Um, I would just come back to inequality, which I think we should spend a lot of more, I mean, a lot of people do think about it, talk about it, but I think it's important in this context as well. Um, I'm not sure what to make of all of the prognoses, but if they're anywhere near accurate, a number of jobs will be automated out of existence in the next few decades. And uh, what does that mean for the people who um, uh, are out of work? Uh, do we need a universal basic income? Um, who owns the new technologies and how is that shared across society? Um, and then just being out of work is a sort of social malaise. Like, what does that mean for a person's identity and their sense of purpose in life? I think these are important questions. And I think that um, we need to think uh, about uh, how we're going to address, um, address this kind of deep issue of, of the fact that we don't quite agree on inequality and what we can do about it. Mm -hmm. It, and, and interesting because different societies think about inequality differently to the question of whose values um, uh, and, and all the conversations about data dividends and, and whatnot are also quite fascinating um, culturally specific solutions to that to those types of problems, but really fascinating ones. Um, so we just have a few minutes left. This is a room presumably full of uh, really dedicated, optimistic uh, activists, do-gooders, philanthropists. Um, and I think this a type of conversation that's so broad and so far ranging can be both helpful and daunting. So let's try to bring it back to home in terms of like what you see are the biggest needs for philanthropists. Like how, if philanthropists wanted to get involved in shaping the values of technology that they're getting developed, what are their biggest opportunities? What would be your call to action for them? Well, I, th I think it would be to, to look for those projects that are trying to tackle with the most complex problems because they're not going to get solved quickly. <clears throat> and most people who are trying to you know, run a business that produces better numbers every 90 days are, are going to focus on the, the tactical short term. So you know, the, the role of uh, philanthropy, I think, can be to, to look far out, to think about the long-term horizon uh, and help sponsor projects which which aren't going to generate cash in the short term, or maybe ever, but may answer some of these really hard questions that we're facing. So I had mentioned this possibility of a code of ethics. I think there's room for a, a sort of trusted convening organization to bring a variety of players, governments, universities across the world together to think about the right way to use technology and you know, in our space sort of you know, with, with respect to uh, behavioral science, but even more broadly. Um, but I would also just say it's important to keep doing what you're doing, right? I mean, we're talking about the complications of new technology, but one, one really basic principle is do as much good as you can, you know? And that's, that's hard to live up to, and we need to keep trying to live up to that and bring access to people who are currently, out of, you know, marginalized. And on the codes of ethics, there's a number of burgeoning efforts around that. Some are, you know, some are data codes of ethics and some are AI codes of ethics and whatnot. I think there's, there is a larger opportunity also for philanthropists to help scale those into practice because it's right now a very fractured field. Um, so I think that's one very concrete opportunity. Other ideas or suggestions? Just building on your point and, and Simon's point, Silicon Valley has gotten very good at building billion dollar or multi-billion dollar technology companies. 
We have huge market failures, however, when it comes to the small work that has to be done to prove pilots and the big work that has to be done to design systems and, and sectors and fields. Uh, and I think those are two gaps that technology, that philanthropy can really help to address. Um, yeah, in, in some of the work that we did back at the State Department on internet freedom, I was fond of saying that these technologies, like nuclear power, uh, you know, can be used to light up a city or destroy it. Steel can be used to build hospitals or machetes. These technologies are neutral, but we're not. And we have an opportunity both in small scale pilots and in big scale system level thinking uh, to put our values to work in, in a way that frankly hasn't happened enough as we've focused on growing billion dollar companies. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I guess, um, you, you know, from the standpoint of earth imaging and geospatial technology, one of the things I see is the philanthropic market is exceptionally fragmented. Um, not only for those organizations that are doing the work themselves, but for their grantees. And there doesn't appear to be a lot of learning in the community. One of the things we're trying to do is create that connective tissue uh, for the grantees and putting out thought leadership pieces and best use cases and, and th things of that nature. But I'm, what I'm also starting to see is there may be the need for, if you will, a buyer's club, where I, I actually think the global development humanitarian response community is maybe the fourth largest market of satellite imagery globally. No one would have guessed that. The first is the intelligence communities across the globe, primarily um, the EU and the US. They are the anchor tenants for two commercial companies that would be bankrupt without them. They get 350 to $400 million a year, whether they deliver one image or a million images. Um, that's followed closely by agriculture, ConAgra, and a whole, whole host of other large global agricultural players. Third, fourth, is the global development and humanitarian community that I don't think you ever knew you were that important. And I don't think you're leveraging your buying power. I think you have a lot more buying power. And, and if there were some way to coalesce, the organizations like DFID, like the World Bank, like Omidyar Network, like the Gates Foundation and others, I think we could make your money go a lot farther, a lot faster, to drive and create information that help relieve some of the world's greatest suffering. Thank you. So I, I, this this topic can be daunting, um, but I I want to I want to end on uh, a note of encouragement, which is to say we've been here before. Uh, you know, there's a there have been people that have been calling tech big tobacco. I think a more apt analogy is the automobile industry. And you know, automobiles have done amazing things in the world, and there was a distinct movement funded by philanthropy to help automobiles become safe, to develop safety standards, um, to develop regulations, to make sure that these safety standards were adopted. And now we see automobile companies competing on safety. And we're about to see an, another regime in automobiles around electric uh, automobiles and self-driving cars. The technology and, uh, and industries progress often with these very clear interventions. Uh, we have also seen it in tech. You know, 20 years ago, it was not par for the course for an engineer to be able to red light a product based on security concerns. But a group of, you know, very clear concerned individuals and technologists came together to develop standards around security and norms such that now it is par for the course to have a red light on a product development based on security concerns. So so I'm very optimistic that this crisis that we're in right now is a major opportunity um, and an inflection point in which the efforts of all of us in the room can really help determine not just how these companies are run, but how technology that is going to be so central to all of our lives is going to affect positively the lives of our children and grandchildren down the line. Um, so I wanna thank you all for, for staying with us at, for this dinner and a thank you to all of the panelists for the rich comments. Um, and, uh, and just a quick note that, um, that we're starting tomorrow, I believe at seven in the morning, is that correct? 
Um, so bright and early, we look forward to another rich day of conversation and, and, and thank you again to all of the panelists.